that's referred to over there in Revelation, the Word of God was with God in the beginning. And when we talk about the beginning with God, that's the real beginning, eternity past, if you will. And it also teaches us that the Word was God. The Word was not just a God, but the Word was God, the very God. And we're told there also that all things, all created things, were created by the Word of God. The one who is called the Word created all created things, with no exception. Everything that was created was made by Him. But so that we don't imagine a new mysterious being trying to think about this one who was God and the one who was with God, John is very quick within the same chapter to point us to someone that we already know the one that has already been pointed out to John as being the Word. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, we read, And the Word was made flesh, took human form, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John, of course, is referring to Jesus Christ in these verses. And so John gives the title to Jesus Christ the Word of God. And because Scripture is inspired, we know that this is not a John-invented title, but this is a title that God revealed to John about Jesus. But tonight we're going to have a look at that idea. What does that mean? That Jesus Christ is the Word of God. I probably could have asked you that right at the start and said, who is the Word of God? And you probably would have said in chorus, Jesus. But what does it mean that Jesus is is the Word of God. Well, quite simply, and to answer the question straight away, it means that Jesus is the expression of God. Jesus Christ is the expression of the invisible God. Jesus is the greatest of all ways that God expresses himself. Now, God expresses himself a lot of times. It's called revelation. That's where God tries to communicate with us about himself. But Jesus is the greatest method of revelations because he is God. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 talks about this idea. I'll, I'll read it to you. God, who at sundry or various times and in diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Can you see how the Son there is fulfilling the role of words? God has spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So we can see it's related back to that idea of the word was creator. Who being the brightness of his glory, or as bright as God's glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And so God is not silent. God expresses himself. God reveals himself to his creation. But the primary way that he reveals himself was and is through his son. Jesus, it says there in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, is as bright as the glory of God. Jesus is the express image of him, his person or the exact impression of God. Now, if you think about that, the only way that someone can be as bright in glory as God is for them to be God. And the only way that someone can be the exact impression of God is for them to be God, because God is someone impossible to impersonate. And the Bible tells us that Jesus was exactly God. And so God is expressed through Jesus Christ. Now, the first time that Jesus Christ came, as we learned about this morning, and I appreciate that message this morning, it fits nicely with tonight's message. The first time that Jesus came, he came to express the love of God, the grace of God, the truth of salvation in God by becoming our Savior, by dying upon the cross. John chapter 3 and verse 16, that wonderful verse tells us that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because God loved, he sent Jesus. Jesus was the expression of his love. 
And as God's exact expression, this was also, we should say, Jesus' love too. It wasn't just God who loved us, God the Father, but it was also God the Son, or Jesus Christ. But now here in his final book, in Revelation chapter 19, John speaks of another time where the Word of God would come as the expression of God. This time it was not the expression of God's love, here in Revelation chapter 19, but Jesus Christ, the Word of God, comes as the expression of God's justice and God's wrath. It's the same idea, but it's another coming. And so Jesus is the Word of God that is pictured there in Revelation chapter 19. He is the expression of God's character and He is the embodiment of God's written Word. That's why He's called the Word of God there. Now, before we move on and have a look at some things about the Word of God, let's just reorient ourselves because some of you haven't been here for our series thus far and some of you have been here for so long that you're totally lost as to where we're up to. Revelation chapter 19 occurs well after God's church has been taken to heaven by Jesus Christ, taken to the safety of heaven for this seven years of tribulation which commences thereafter. Now, as we have seen, those years of tribulation have been described through three sets of seven judgments. We saw, first of all, there were seven seals, which then led us to the seven trumpets, which then led us to the seven vials or seven bowls. And within each of these sets of seven, or between each of these sets of seven, we have some explanatory notes to help us to figure out what John is speaking about during each of those seven things. Now in Revelation chapter 19, where we're up to tonight, we're in the seventh vial, judgment, which, if you put things together, is the last judgment of the last set of judgments. So if you're here tonight for the first time, you've come at a good time because it's a very action-filled judgment. This is where we find the return of Jesus Christ, the Word of God to fulfill as the crescendo of God's judgments, to fulfill His justice. Now, last time we had a look at this passage, because we've looked at this passage once before, we had a look firstly at the superlative of His coming, how that when He comes, He will be so different to everyone who's ever come before claiming to be a Christ, that everyone would know that this is the Christ. We saw the superlative of His coming. We saw, secondly, the supremacy of His crown, that when He comes to conquer, He will establish a kingdom that is over all other kingdoms. He won't have to negotiate or have foreign policies with other people. Jesus Christ will be the unilateral ruler of the world. And then we started looking at a third point, the sword of His conquest. And in the start of that point, we saw that his coming would not only result in peace upon the earth once it's finished, but before that, his coming would result in widespread death of those who oppose him. And that was a sobering note. And so tonight, we're going to start right there at the sword of his conquest, because we've got some unfinished business in this part. And so the sword of his conquest continued... We'll start on point number three. Look how fast we're moving. Armies of history have often had weaponry uh, or specialized units that have characterized their empire. And I'm sure if you think back through Greek, yep, Roman, yep, Egyptian, yep, you can think about how some of them were characterized. And you would think given the scope and the success of the empire of the Lord Jesus Christ, he must have had some cutting edge weaponry. He must have had some crack special assistance in order to establish an empire like this. But this is not the case. In fact, that we read that when Jesus comes, he will conquer the world with a single sword. A sword, a sharp sword. Jesus Christ will conquer the world with a sword. There's also the mention of a rod, but as we'll see, that's about his ruling. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, it is interesting that Jesus can conquer the whole world with a sword, 
one sword. But it's even more interesting to note that this sword is not wielded in his hands, but it proceeds from his mouth. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Now, in order to understand this, I think we don't have to try and uh, imagine some fanciful concept, but we have to rely upon the progressive revelation through Scripture. And we have to have a look at what we already know about this picture from the New Testament. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, because this is a metaphor that we've probably already come across. We interpret the book of Revelation literally. But in order to interpret the book of Revelation literally, it doesn't mean that we have to take every single thing as actually physical. It means that we have to appreciate the historical and grammatical and literary interpretation of Revelation, which means that we have to appreciate the use of English devices to convey ideas such as metaphor. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, we read of one. It says, For the word of God is quick or living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now there is a lot more there than we can go through tonight. But it tells us that God's revealed word, or God's revealed word here is compared with a sword and it's described as being living and as being powerful a living powerful sword that's the way that God's word is described God's uh, sorry a normal sword a, a physical sword if you saw it used in battle it can pierce skin muscle uh, break bone but the word it can pierce between the soul and the spirit now <laughs> Theologians have trouble dividing between the soul and the spirit and which one's which. Now, the fact that the word of God can pierce to the dividing of the soul and the spirit to the very deepest part of us, to the dividing of the joints and marrow, which some people think is a way of describing our very innermost workings. The word can penetrate the deepest parts of our body, soul and spirit, all of us. The Word of God can change the spiritual life that we have. The Word of God can result in us getting saved. It can change our spirit. Uh, the Word of God can change our soul. It can change the way that we think about things. It can change our emotions. And the brain is a very interesting organ of the body because by changing the way that we think, it can actually change the anatomy of the brain. It can reroute, it can change the physical makeup of the brain by the changing of the way that we think. And so the Word of God can change our body, soul and spirit. The Word of God can change all of us. And it does. I'm sure you've felt it at times. I'm sure you've heard the preaching of the Word or you've read the Word for yourself and you've come across something and you've thought, wow, that's just what I'm going through. Or perhaps you've read a passage of the Bible and you've thought, no, that can't be applied to me because I don't want to have to apply that. It's just so applicable at this time of my life. The Word of God has a way of just piercing us and doing it in a way that we can be so sure about what God is saying. The Word can cut deeper into us than any surgeon. The Word can probe deeper into our thoughts than any counsellor. The Word of God truly is quick, powerful and sharp. Now, this is because it is living and it is powerful as the Word of God, but it's also because it's applied by the Spirit of God. Let's have a look in Ephesians chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll read from verses 13 through 17. We've got to put together this idea of a sword. And then once we've got this idea, we'll go back to Revelation 19. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 to 17. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We have a very important statement here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Uh, I think about it like a, a maths problem. Sometimes we have to get an, an equality so that when the, then we can take it and apply it into another uh, formula. And it's like what we've got here in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. The word of God is equated to the sword of the spirit. That's what we're told here in Ephesians chapter 6. And so the spirit that knows our hearts, the spirit that knows our thoughts, is the one that wields the word of God. No wonder he's so good at wielding it. No wonder it convicts us so well because he knows our thoughts. No wonder it encourages us when we need it because he knows our thoughts. He knows our problems. He knows us better than we know ourselves. The spirit perfectly diagnoses our heart and perfectly prescribes the word so that we are deeply affected by the word of God as it is applied. And so it is the spirit that wields the sword. It is the sword of the spirit. It is they are associated one with another. And so the word of God is the sword of the spirit. And if we take this idea back to Revelation chapter 19 and plug it into the passage, it should help us to understand what we see there. Revelation chapter 19. It says in verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. This is why the sword is pictured as proceeding from his mouth. The simple reason is because Jesus here at his second coming is speaking the word of God. He is speaking the sword of the spirit. The word that slays those who are guilty and rebellious. The truth is Jesus' weapon of conquest. Now, you might say, well, hang on a second. Isn't the truth something that convinces us? Can the truth actually kill a person? Go and ask Ananias. Oh, sorry, you can't. He's dead. <laughs> Why? Because he offended God by lying and he was slain. Because Peter spoke to him the truth and he died. But you know, I think there's an even better example, an even more relevant example in John chapter 18. As we think about the Lord Jesus Christ coming up to the time of his death, his betrayal, where he looks like um, the Lamb of God who is a sacrifice. Let's remember that this is the real power of Jesus Christ. John chapter 18 and verse 5. The rabble band come looking for someone to arrest. And Jesus says, who are you looking for? John chapter 18 and verse 5. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. I'm so glad we've got verse 6 included. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. I don't think that was just out of astonishment. These verses, along with other verses of Scripture, which talk about the effect that happens when the truth can be spoken to someone, show to us that the word can have a physical effect. The word can have a physical effect. And we think about it not just in regards to the supernatural application of the word, but also if you think about in the Old Testament, sometimes someone received news and it affected them so much that they gave up the ghost. They were shocked to the point where it killed them. Now, very interestingly, if you're still there in John chapter 18, just have a look at verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Isn't that an interesting comparison between the power of a real sword 
and the power of the words spoken from the mouth of Jesus. The whole band was knocked to the ground when Jesus says, I am he. But Peter with a sword could only get one ear of the group. Now this truth that is spoken in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15, out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. It tells us that it will smite the nations. That word the nations is the same expression that's used for Gentiles in our Bibles. And so it talks about the judgment of all the nations, particularly those who stand against God. And then it tells us, and he shall rule them, Revelation 19, 15, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Now, this is a really often repeated prophecy in the Old Testament, that when the Messiah comes, he will rule them with a rod of iron. Psalm 2 is one instance where we find that. But it shows to us here, and we're not going to go into it too much because we'll look at it when it comes to the time of his rule. It shows to us that his conquest will continue into a strong reign as the king of kings. He will rule them with a rod of iron. Verse 15 then goes on to to finish with an explanatory note. Revelation 19, 15, And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This is not a separate idea. This is another way of explaining what we've just read. When Jesus Christ comes and he smites the world with the sword that proceeds from his mouth, he will be treading the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, we had a look at this last time just to see the imagery and what it meant. But just for tonight, the significance of this statement is to show that there is great harmony between Almighty God and the Word when He comes to execute the will of Almighty God. Jesus comes to judge not just out of personal ambition, and not out of some sort of personal vendetta, but he comes as the expression of the judgment of the Father. When he comes and he slays those who are against God with the word of his mouth, when he comes and does that, it will be in line with treading the winepress of the fierceness of God. He will be acting in accordance with the will of the Father. Now, if we just pause there before we move on and take stock of what we've got here, we realize that this is being presented to us as an act of the Trinity. This judgment, this return of Christ is something that they are all present in. The Father, Son and Spirit worked harmoniously in creation and we knew it. The Father, Son and Spirit worked harmoniously in redemption and that was shown quite clearly to us as well through the scriptures. But here we see that they are also prominent in judgment. God is united in judging mankind. The Son proceeds from the Father. He is the Word of God. And the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Because the Spirit comes forth from the mouth of the Word, and the Word came forth from the Father. And they are very important concepts for us to get. God is united in all that he does. And so this is a picture of God united in perfect harmony. There's no discussion about whether this is valid or not. There's no one out on this as there never is with God. God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit combine to judge mankind because it's right. Verse 4 brings us to the last verse that we're going to have a look at in this passage. Verse 14. This is our last point. It says the support of his cavalry. That's the name of the point, the support of his cavalry. It says in Revelation 19, 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now we looked at verse 15 before we had a look at verse 14 because verse 15 continued the idea of the conquest of the word in verse 13. We had a look at how this passage sort of associates from its extremities in towards the center. And so we'll finish off with verse 14 tonight. Who is this army that arrives with Jesus? Well, they're suggested to be either angels or people or angels and people for those who don't want to make up a mind. (laughs) Now, both 
to be blunt, in my perspective, both are possible. Both angels and people are possible. I've heard arguments on both sides. Jesus refers to angels as the legions of angels that are attendant upon him in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus also speaks about the angels being present and involved in the judgment of mankind, and we hear that through many of the parables. However, the church, the bride of Christ, has just been described in this very chapter in very similar terms. Have a look in Revelation 19 and verse 8. Revelation 19, verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, just look there in verse 14. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And don't say, well, one says white and clean and the other says clean and white, so they can't be the same. <laughs> Also, in support of the idea that the church is this army, is that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it tells us that when Christ comes to receive the church unto himself, the promise for the church then is that so shall they ever be with the Lord. Okay, now that promise tells us that where Jesus goes, we go. If I'm ever going to be with the Lord, then when Jesus comes to earth in his conquest, I'll be right there alongside him. That's the way that I take 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Where Christ goes, his bride will go. And if I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, then I'm a part of that bride of Christ, as we saw two weeks ago. And so the armies of heaven following upon white horses represent the glorified church. And this evening, brethren, if you are trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation. It sounds like a simple thing, doesn't it? If you're a Christian, a real Christian, saved, then one day Jesus is going to come to earth to take you to be with him in heaven. He is going to give you immortality when you get there to heaven and the adequate rewards for the life that we have lived here upon the earth. And then, when Jesus rides to earth in his triumph, you will ride alongside him or in his trail. Jesus Christ rides to take the establish the kingdom and we ride with him. Now, before you get all excited and think, wow, the battle, there's only one weapon mentioned in this passage. And the only, mention, the only weapon mentioned in this passage is the sword that proceeds from the mouth of Christ. It's the only one. And that suggests to us that the saints do not fight with Christ. And notice that in the Lord Jesus Christ's case, the Word of God, he was in a vesture dipped with blood. The saints' vesture, or those who ride along with him, their linen is white and clean, or clean and white, however you want to remember it. It's a different idea. And so I would suggest to you that the army comes with the Lord Jesus Christ to share in the victory. But Jesus Christ, by the application of the sword that proceeds from his mouth, will be able to complete the battle by himself. He is the one who finally finishes the victory that he has already won on the cross. And so what a powerful picture. The word of God, the sword that proceeds from his mouth, the armies riding from heaven in his company. As we were reminded of this morning, today is Palm Sunday, still is Palm Sunday. Today is the day that we remember that Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem upon an ass, a symbol of the peace that he brought with him to offer to those who were there. But you know, next time he comes to earth, he won't be riding an ass. After he's been to collect his church and take them to safety, when he comes to the earth, he won't be riding that ass of peace again. Next time he comes, he won't be offering peace. Jesus, the word of God, expresses the Father. That's, uh, his, that's been his role in his coming. 
It was because God loved the world so much that the only begotten Son came to save us. That's why he died upon the cross for us, because he was expressing the love that God had for us. And now the Spirit of God uses that word to so well pierce our hearts and convict us of our need for salvation, that we are sinners, and that our holiness, that our righteousness is not enough to earn our salvation, but that we need the death that Jesus Christ, uh, the victory that Jesus Christ won for us through his death upon the cross. It's the only way that we can be saved, by faith in his work. Now the Spirit of God uses the word to lead us to salvation. He leads us to the point of a choice. The Spirit of God calls us to faith. Believe, believe. Very soon the Father will send the Son in all of his power to express not the love of God, but the wrath of God, the judgment of God. God will send his Son again. And when the Spirit uh, employs the word on that coming of Jesus Christ, it won't be as an invitation. The Spirit will use the word of God to force the truth upon the hearts of sinners and they will die as a result. The guilty heart will crumble under the force of a word that speaks of holiness. When God's holy law is applied to the heart of someone who has broken it, they will perish. No sinner will be able to bear that day. And so the advice of God's word, a good reminder for us, especially in light of this morning's message too, We need to receive the humble saviour before we face the fearsome king. He is the same God, the same God who balances both love and justice, but he knows that he's given you a chance already. The word of God will triumph one way or another, either by us choosing it and choosing to accept it or by him thrusting it upon our heart in judgment. I trust that tonight you'll examine your heart and I trust that you'll think about whether you have received the Lord Jesus Christ for yourself. And if not, take the chance to receive the word before it's thrust upon you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know it's not a pleasant one uh, to see the the souls that will perish at the time where you come to exact justice and judgment upon the earth. But Father, we thank you for it because it's a warning. It helps all of us tonight to know, Lord, what's coming. Uh, Father, so many people are looking for the answers to the end of the world. Lord, we have it right here. Help us to be taught. Help us to be warned. And Lord, if there's anyone here tonight who is not sure that they are a Christian, a true believer, And I pray that you would help them to receive the word of God, receive the call to salvation before it's too late. We thank you, Lord, for our time in your word. We pray that you would help us to see the glory of Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.